All right. Hi, folks. Um, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you, Jonathan and the whole crew. This is great. Uh, so yeah, we're going to talk about containers, right? Like that's what we're all here for, right? Um, and um, I think uh, much like Len's talk, this is going to be, you know, this is a culture talk because, you know, I got to tell you, like when people call culture talks soft talks, I say, yeah, but computers are easy and people are hard. So this stuff is actually a little more complicated than you'd think. So let's talk about it. Um, first, the uh, obligatory second slide, the one where you're like, we're, we're already listening to you. You don't have to tell us who you are. But um, because I'm not from here, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and if you're not super familiar with the United States, it's in the middle at the top, right up by Canada by the giant lakes. We have all the water. <laughs> um, sorry, California. <laughs> um, and <laughs> and uh, we have, I, mean, I work for Pivotal. Um, I do uh, tech advocacy for the open source Cloud Foundry platform as a service. Um, and uh, I am a co-host of the podcast Arrested DevOps. So uh, I gave a bunch of the stickers to Adrian. So you can check with him if he's, a, he's a, your purveyor of stickers, if you end up listening to that and would like a sticker. And I'm also part of the shadowy global cabal that organizes DevOps days everywhere. And the great thing is that um, talking to your local DevOps meetup organizers, they are actually going to do a DevOps days here in Cape Town. So it'll be later this year. So you'll get a chance to make Jonathan stand up on stage. It'll be fantastic. Um, OK, so the other thing that was really funny so far this conference is listening to the kind of the gentle ban uh, you know, banter about marketing. Because I got to tell you, like, I spent my entire career in ops. Um, I was on call for production infrastructure from 1999 until last August. Uh, I was not sad to delete the PagerDuty app from my phone. Um, I, I had to screenshot like the moment of deleting it because it made me super happy. Uh, but when I took this tech advocacy job, which by the way, I technically report up through marketing. Ooh, I know. Like there is an evil marketer among you. An evil marketer with a lot of opinions about, you know, bash. So. Um, <laughs> And it, as it turns out, trading on call for more travel, um, you don't actually sleep more. It's like, oh, the jet lag, right? Forgot about that. Uh, but anyway, so this picture is, and I, I'm not kidding when I say not Photoshopped. I mean, other than the word DevOps, there were, there were not like 800 units of DevOps in that shipping container. But this picture is not Photoshopped. This is a, an actual picture I took. Um, in Minneapolis, where for some reason there were a whole bunch of shipping containers next to a bunch of silos under a bunch of clouds, and I was like, this is perfect. I I'm going to put this in a conference talk someday, and this is the first conference talk I've used it in. So, um, well, this and, you know, uh, prep for this talk. But when I, when I look at, like, all of the stuff where people think, you know, adding some containers will definitely fix everything that is wrong, it's like, oh, I have news for you. Like, containers, like I said in the title, will not fix your broken culture. Like, if you have, you know, contention between resource or otherwise, between um, members of your ops tribe or your dev tribe or um, the, the DevOps team that sometimes people put between the ops and the devs, because adding another silo will totally solve these things. Like, that is kind of an anti-pattern. Like, that's not actually going to make things better. Um, and magically rubbing some cloud on it, also not going to make things better. Like we had, you know, Bethany from Etsy was talking, and Etsy is well known for being fantastic at DevOps, and they use neither cloud nor containers. So like th these things are not a panacea. They're not going to actually fix anything that you're trying to fix inside your organization. Um, and like when I'm talking about Docker, and I say like it's not going to actually fix whatever problems you might think it's going to fix, uh, I say that having run Docker in production myself for a year. Um, I think I, I saw a show of hands earlier, like how many people here have used Docker in some way? I think, oh yeah, so a good like, you know, 15, 20% of the room. And how many have used Docker in production? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine people. Um, so yeah, it's when you have used it in production, you're like, yeah, re like theory, reality. By the way, have you ever heard about the, the old joke about somebody who was saying that they called their staging server theory? I was like, it works in theory. I'm like, oh my god, seriously? <laughs> it's like, um, but, but anyway, so the place that we were running Docker in production um, was a streaming, it, it still is, um, 
I don't work there anymore, but I'm still, you know, I still heart all of my drama fever people. And it's a streaming video site that is, it's a lot like Netflix, if Netflix were much smaller and mostly Korean soap opera and, <laughs> and ran Docker in production. So, which Netflix is starting to do some stuff with Docker, which is pretty cool. But we still had, you know, a separate ops team and dev team. We still had contention between the two. We still had to fight over, you know, who was, who was going to make the call as to at code freeze time, if we were going to throw a release out there, what exactly was going to be in that release? And could we just put one more thing in it? And you're like, the thing that you merged 10 seconds before code freeze, like, has that actually been tested? I mean, I don't know, maybe. Like, if the automated test passed, right, it's probably fine. Um, we were also trying to win at buzzword bingo. So we were also uh, decomposing our Python Django monolith into a bunch of Go microservices. And no joke, this is actually um, probably half of why I went to go work there in spring 2014, because they've been running Docker in production since October uh, 2013, when like, I think the main thing on Docker's website at that point was like giant letters, possibly in blink, that said, under no circumstances should you run this in production. And we were like, YOLO. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the decomposing stuff into microservices actually made a lot of sense. And we weren't doing it necessarily to be like exciting and trendy. We were doing it because when you have a giant Python Django monolith and somebody really wants to ship one specific thing unrelated to the main functionality of the site, but then other people are like, we can't use feature flags because Knight Capital or whatever. And um, that was a feature flag gone wrong story that makes people sad. I see a few people laughing. I'm not going to go into the whole story, but you can, you can Google it. Um, but uh, when... People are doing an anti-pattern that we were doing where they were equating like the release of the software with the release of new features, then people would have disagreements about when exactly the code push could be. And so at least breaking stuff up would make it possible to push the back end things that you really needed um, without making possibly breaking changes to the parts that people were interacting with. Um, but here's the thing, just like containers did not actually change the fact that we still had to, you know, fight all those fights, um, having microservices did not change the fact that like when we started trying to do two pizza teams, which by the way, two pizza team is like, okay, but how hungry are these people? Like how big are the pizzas? I feel like there are many unanswered questions in the two pizza team idea. But for you, when you're going to break up into smaller teams and have those teams um, work on different individual, you know, individuated components, like, that doesn't change the fact that they still have to agree about where the boundaries of the microservice are going to be. And, like, microservices are, they're sort of complex. And there's kind of, you know, there's back and forth about this. Like, Adrian Cockcroft has tweeted that um, a monolith is, is complex too, it just hides the complexity, which is totally true. But, when you are trying to make clean boundaries between your microservices, you have to decide, I mean, how micro is micro? Like, we had an image resizer. It did one thing. It did it somewhat well. And when you're, by the way, oh, okay, so sidebar, I'm going to have a, I, like some people in the room who are old enough to be nostalgic for SunOS 413 and who maybe programmed in Lisp, I know there's at least one or two of you out there, because one of them was speaking right before me, um, is uh, I have a lot of cars and could da da and everything I'm going to say. So just assume that there's like, you know, parentheses, parentheses, parentheses. Um, when, you're, when you're setting up your microservices, one of the things I think, there's a lot of debate. I don't know if it's really debate. It's just kind of, you know, disagreement about where the proper bounds of a specific service are. And I have a pretty strong opinion, loosely held, I'm willing to discuss it, that if you can't have a health endpoint that can answer the question, is this service completely working, yes or no? And if like, it just, you know, says, well, some parts of it are working, okay, you have too many parts in there. Like if you're gonna decompose things anyway, break that down more so that you can test the functionality and say, this is working or this is not. Um, but these are conversations that you need to have between the teams, right? Because if you're gonna have, um, like say, you know, the new version of an API we heard about earlier this year, like, or sorry, this conference, jet lag, still a thing. Um, but the new version of an API, okay, that's cool. Are you ever gonna be deprecating the old API? Which services should be using the new API immediately? Is the new API gonna have all the features that maybe the people who are writing the Android app need? Like, 
So just because you have small teams does not mean the teams don't have to talk to each other. And communication between humans, as it turns out, still sort of complicated. Like the, this is a, a restating of Conway's law that is, it's not the exact wording from his 1968 paper, How Committees Invent, which by the way, I don't know how anybody read to the end to get to the good stuff of that paper because how committees invent, it's just like, really? But maybe, maybe in 1968, that was a really exciting title. I don't know. Um, but uh, the idea that a lot of people look at Conway's Law and they think, oh, so what this means is that because my organization's structure is going to dictate the design of my software, I need to break my organization up into teams that exactly map what I want the design of my software to be. And I think that they're missing what I think is the most important word in here, actually, which is communication structure. Hey, Conway's Law does not actually say you must have two pieces of teams that exactly, your org chart has to look exactly like your software architecture diagram. Like, that's not what it says. It says that the communication between the different parts of your organization is going to dictate how the software communicates. So I think that that's it's kind of an important point. And it's also, I think it's interesting to think about the fact that if you're, if you look at like, you know, graph theory, like the, the amount of connections that you're going to have when you have a larger team does mean that it's going to be a lot harder to keep good communication on that team. I mean, that's why we have Dunbar's number and, you know, single track conferences that you have to cap the attendance and sell out and everything else. It's like there, there are only so many people that you can fit into any given, you know, relationship graph. But when you're, when you're trying to interoperate in a large organization, you do have to work in smaller groups, but those groups do have to communicate. And Sorry, Amazon, but like the whole, we only communicate through APIs. I mean, that works super well, except for the part where somebody deprecates an API or there's breaking changes that one group doesn't really communicate to another group. So I feel like technology alone does not solve these problems. Um, and also, by the way, like, I feel like, like, we, like we heard earlier um, that we talk a lot about tech. And we talk about tech because we're interested in it. And that's why we're here, right? Like, we want to talk about tech. And uh, I thought it was super funny when Kelsey Hightower tweeted this and was like, you know, if you want to get your talks accepted, put the word unikernel in them. And then it was, it was, it was even funnier when uh, this Brian guy was like, yeah, okay, so we're going to go with, like, what, were, what was the hyped up word that's, like, in every conference talk? DevOps, Docker, containers, unikernels. Um, and he's, he's pretty excited for, you know, the uh, 2019 is going to be the year of the inode, right? Like, that's going to be the thing that we're all super focused on. And <laughs> I feel like there's... This is kind of missing the point, right? Like, if, we're, if we only want to talk about, um, you know, containers and the orchestrating and scheduling thereof, then we've missed those conversations about how do you convince people that they want to try this platform that you're, this delightful artisanal bespoke platform that you have lovingly handcrafted from a bunch of, let's see, in our case, it was Docker, Packer, Chef, Jenkins, a lot of AWS command line stuff in Bodo. Um, and of course, janky bash, because like when people tell you there's no janky bash underlying their homegrown platforms, like they're, they're totally lying. Um, but I mean, or not even homegrown, there's, there's janky bash in Cloud Foundry too. So, um, but when we're, we always want to talk about this tech stuff and then it's like, it's, it's basically just, I always think of the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, so like, I, I don't know, shout it out. Where do people think we are right now with like containers, schedulers, the orchestrating thereof? Are we, are we at inflated expectations? Are we already disillusioned? What do we think? Some disillusionment? So you've used it, okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, computers, I have met those. Um, and I think that a lot of this, like this hype stuff and the, the stuff that we all end up talking about is like what um, Schaefer, and this is, uh, sadly, it's a tweet from me and not from him because he said it in a podcast, but uh, I love what uh, Andrew Claire Schaefer says about how 90% of tech is tribalism and fashion. It's like, oh, okay, like the people who I'm going to listen to are doing this. I'm going to try that. And in some respects, it makes perfect sense, right? Like, you probably are going to eat the thing that isn't killing the other members of your, your social circle. I mean, you want to you wanna try the thing that people have had success with. The, the, really inter the really interesting thing about this whole tribalism and fashion thing is that um, working for a vendor now, I sometimes go in and talk to, you know, the large enterprise customers, and they always want to hear, so what kind of success have other people in our specific vertical, whether it be, you know, like cars or insurance or whatever, what kind of success retail, what kind of success have they been having with this specific technology stack? And I'm like, okay, I mean, like, 
Sure, it's a valid question, but also people are very much looking for people that they consider to be of their tribe that will tell them whether or not these berries are safe to eat. You know? um, and I feel like we are in a place where things have changed. Like, uh, there was, a, even a couple years ago, uh, Schaefer was putting in all of his slide decks like a whole Gatling gun, the game has changed sort of thing. And it, it makes me think of, um, uh, Commander Sinclair at the end of the first season of Babylon 5, and I feel like our, uh, and if you haven't watched it, it's okay, you should probably not watch the first season, because the first season's kind of bad, like, the second season is when it gets really good. Um, but right at the end of uh, the first season, like, everything is different. Um, like, one of the ambassadors has entered a cocoon, and it's just like, what is, is you know, trying to become a butterfly, I think is one of the, one of the other ambassadors' jokes. But um, basically, our industry is in this chrysalis moment. I mean, like, we can, we can look back at history really easily and say, oh, these were inflection points. This is where things changed. And I think that that's harder to do, like, when you're in it, in the current moment. But obviously, the rise of virtualization was a huge difference. And the rise of containerization, similarly, I think is a huge difference. Because at that point, people are starting to look at things like, how do we increase our utilization? Okay, we're going we're gonna to have some amount of spend in this data center or in this public or private cloud or hybrid or whatever. And, okay, if we want to have better utilization, we have to do some kind of application container clustering. We have to do some kind of scheduling them. And we had several great talks here where we were talking about exactly how not easy that is. It's like, it's easy to say, we would like to have a billion percent utilization on every single CPU. And then you try to actually do that, and you're like, okay, no, this doesn't work. Um, but we are definitely in a place where we have to think about that stuff now. Where before you were like, you know, I, I did a purchase order, I got something from a vendor, I plugged it in. And it's like, well, we don't really operate like that anymore. And I think in, especially in a lot of larger enterprises, there's a lot of people who have been working with the very similar stuff that hasn't changed for a long time, or hasn't changed enough to really, you know, be this see change, this like complete shift in their mentality. And then they're, they're very resistant. And I think this is where you get, if you are trying to introduce some kind of change inside your organization, and you get people who are bringing in that FUD that we were talking about, a lot of it is the fear. Like, if you get whatever it is you want, you set up that Mesos and Marathon thing, what about my VMs? And what about my exciting ticket-based process by which you provision new VMs and send tickets to my department and I have my fiefdom and I have all my people? And it's like, so you're, you're not just fighting against the is Mesos and Marathon or whatever choice you're talking about um, the right choice for your organization. You're also fighting against people who don't want you to pick any of the above because then things will change and the ground underneath their feet will be you know, uncertain and they won't know what's going on with their job. Do they still have a job? Are, do, are they still needed? And I, th I really like this Deming quote um, where he says that it's not necessary to change because survival is not mandatory. Because it does, it makes me think of that sad snowman. Also not Photoshop. This was, I think, one spring by my house in Minneapolis. Um, Minneapolis, by the way, I didn't, when I mentioned where I live, I didn't mention that we are a state in the United States that has logged snow um, every month of the year except July. Which is why DevOps Days Minneapolis is in July, because like, that's the one month that we know it will not snow. <laughs> but, um, and this, I think I took this picture in like April or May. So the, the sad snowman had not completely melted. But this idea that change is hard, and you know, the, the innovators, the disruptors, the people who went to ScaleConf and came back and they're like, we absolutely need to set up some Docker. We need to be Dockering all the Dockers right now. And like, <laughs> You come back to your organization and you're excited and you say that, and then you get this resistance and you're like, why are they against this thing that's obviously awesome? Which, you know, it is. I mean, Docker is awesome. And you're like, why are they against it? And like, it might be this. They feel like this might be what happens to them. And I think that there's a couple of ways to make people feel more comfortable with this kind of change. Like, for example, if you talk to somebody who's been doing something for a long time, maybe they're worried about startups coming in and disrupting whatever their industry or business is. And you're like, but you do have some advantages, right? Like, so, so you're trying to do a giant lift and shift or a giant migration, and you have this, like, absolutely enormous data store, and you know, every single one of your microservices that you've tried to spin out is still talking to it, because that's a delightful anti-pattern we should all repeat. And um, so somebody is sitting there just kind of 
like wishing that they were on greenfield projects because they don't want to be working on this legacy stuff. But like the reality is, if the legacy stuff weren't important, you wouldn't be trying to migrate it. Like you care about that customer data. Like this is valuable to you. Maybe you're not mining it as effectively as you could be. Maybe you are, and you're mining it with a whole bunch of Fortran jobs or you know COBOL or whatever. And like the idea of changing all those jobs is like a huge undertaking. And so then you're wondering, can we just put the entire mainframe in a container? And it's like, no, probably not. I mean, you can try, but probably not. Um, and that's kind of like when people start saying they want to, they want to try to change whatever the legacy stuff they have into like, you know, a more cloud native, um, you know, applications or whatever, which by the way, like cloud native always confuses me because I'm like, okay, so does that mean that like in order for the large established, you know, uh, enterprises to become cloud native, they have to go through the cloud immigration and naturalization services? Like it makes no sense whatsoever, but um, eh, you know, industry buzzwords, whatever. But the point is like, there is a reason that you're trying to move those old applications and the, those old data stores. Like, I think that a lot of times we forget that because we just glorify the, the exciting Greenfield project that we spun up with, you know, all of the Docker, Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry, whatever. Like, you, you spun that up and you're like, this is running, this is exciting, and then we have all this other stuff over there. Oh, and I showed you a Gartner hype cycle, but I didn't say anything about bimodal IT, and I have to rant about that too. So sidebar, many rants. Um, Bimodal IT is, is a lie. Bimodal IT is basically like saying, we're gonna have one group of people in sad mode and the other group in awesome mode. It's like, it's not fair to anyone because it's putting an immense pressure on the people who have to be the awesome shining star of the organization that are gonna do all of the fun slash change slash greenfield slash whatever things. But then it's also telling all the people who are actually maintaining this stuff that is making the company money that they don't get to have any fun or do anything new and they don't get to change anything. So like, yeah, I, th I think by mo like trying to divide things into two specific ways and saying those are the only two ways we're gonna do any of our transformation is ludicrous. Like there's gonna be a continuum. You're not going to migrate every single application on the same day, but saying that there's this entire group of, and there be, it might be some applications that you will never change. Like we were hearing about with the strangler pattern, you can pull out enough pieces that you can iterate as quickly as you want to, then you might not need to change some of the underlying stuff. I mean, you, you might be paying for those WebSphere licenses forever then, so like you might want to, but, um, but anyway, so enough rants. Let's, let's talk about DevOps in a box. Um, so they, they gave us DevOps in a box with, uh, with DevOps certificates at DevOps Days Ghent in, in 2014, like the, the five-year anniversary of DevOps Days. And it was, you know, all very tongue-in-cheek because it is, of course, delicious Dev and Ops chocolate, and our conference badges made delightful certificates of DevOps. But really, like, you can't, first of all, you can't give one, someone a certificate of DevOps. Like, sorry, Amazon, but if you're saying somebody is DevOps certified, you're saying, like, they passed kindergarten. Right? They learned to like not eat the crayons and to share with the other children. It's like, this is, <laughs> it's like, it's ludicrous. Um, and why would you want to eat crayons if there's Belgian chocolate anyway? But so like, but this idea of, you know, hey, that shipping container earlier with DevOps on it, I would definitely like 800 units of DevOps to be delivered and implemented at my organization. We'll use 600 of them for the people in awesome mode and like the people in sad mode could look at the other 200 but they can't have them. Like that's, that's I feel like that's a lot of, um, a lot of people who are operating in this space, and I work for a vendor now so I can say like, we try very hard to make sure that people understand that we can definitely sell them tools and we can sell them consulting help on their agile transformation. We definitely cannot sell them any sort of DevOps because that is something that they have to do and choose, not something that, and something they practice in a community of people, not something that they're gonna be able to like, you know, buy for delivery two weeks hence. Like that's, that does not exist. Um, and this was, uh, it was a funny enough, like, a couple, like about a, a little over a year ago, there was a lot of discussion on Twitter about this. And by the way, I totally love to screen cap tweets and just put them in talks. So uh, if, if other people are tweeting about this, like it's quite possible if you use the conference hashtag, I will read it later and put it in a talk, so fair warning. Um, but this idea of like, if we replace, you know, Courtney Nash from O'Reilly said, if we replace the word DevOps with the word empathy in absolutely everything, and then of course Jeff Sussman is like, ah, enter an enterprise empathy automation tool. It's like, that sounds great. Um, you know, tongue in cheek. But I really like this idea of 
thinking that the idea of having better communication and better cooperation between teams makes us more effective. And like, if you're thinking at this point, okay, like I didn't sign up for a bunch of kumbaya and handholding, and like that, I, I'm in tech because I don't like people. What are you telling me? I have to go deal with people. And it's like, okay, so all of this, um, you know, all of that touchy feely stuff has an incredibly practical purpose, which is to say, if you have empathy for other human beings and you understand what they want, then you'll have a much better chance of getting them to do what you want because you understand what they want. So like, even just with enlightened self-interest, working to understand other people will probably get you better results than just being like, I'm gonna just type over here in the dark. That's like, that's probably not gonna get, what you, get you what you want. Um, and, uh, the, and speaking of tools also, like this idea of we're gonna have these this, uh, special you know, sacrosanct tools and maybe they're gonna be in a private GitHub repo that only the people on the ops team and maybe the DevOps team, if you have that too, can see. And um, we definitely can't let any developers even see it, let alone touch it, because we gotta keep them separate from each other. And it's like, okay, the problem with this is that if developers don't have good visibility, and that you're a lot of you are developers, so you understand this, if developers don't have good visibility into the way production is actually operating, then they're just gonna be guessing when they try to solve problems. And so like, oh, the developers definitely can't look at the production logs, and you're like, but why? And is there a reason that they can't have read-only access on the whole uh, you know, AWS org? Like, what is, there, what is in there that they can't see, that it's not okay for them to see? Like, and if you do have things for like, you know, audit compliance, you know, HIPAA, whatever reasons, that's a separate question. And then at that point, you deal with you know, your audit stuff that way. But the idea of like, we only have the, the special sacred anointed priesthood of ops people or whatever who are allowed to see and do anything is I think really, antiquated and backwards and doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So, and I think that it's really important too to like think about your architecture and your architectural patterns from that point of view. Like if you want everything to be, if you want good visibility into everything, you want good telemetry, you want you know, self-healing systems, you want uh, only actionable alerts that require your attention to wake you up in the middle of the night. Um, I'm a big fan of only waking up in the middle of the night when I have to, like for a flight or you know, like, HBase is uh, gone. Because, yeah, I, I should have I realized from the term job flow that Amazon's EMR was really not intended to run persistent data stores, even though they, there was a way to run HBase on it. So it's like, oh, a, a bug in this particular um, AMI means that your HBase instance, or you know, the HBase uh, uh, EMR cluster has been terminated. It's like, oh, all of the production data was on there. This is not good. And it's like, I wasn't actually on call then, I just got the call from the developer who was on call um, at about three in the morning, saying like, Amazon says our HBase cluster is terminated. Can you fix it? And I'm like, maybe? It's like, spoiler alert, I did fix it. I did a whole ranty write-up of that for uh, SysAdvent 2013, so you can go read about that there. But the um, point is, when you're thinking about like giving visibility for people who are not necessarily, you know, um, your, like, people with the most production responsibility, giving visibility into your prod system still has a lot of wins that you wouldn't necessarily know about. Like, a couple of jobs ago, I had built a bunch of um, graphs in Graphite and had them on a TV on the wall, and I was, I was working in, a, a, in an ad tech firm, actually, and we had um, one retail customer who was a disparate amount of our traffic for one particular service, and so when one of our uh, customer success people came into work that morning, before I got there, looked at the graph and said, huh, right about three this morning, we had a giant drop off in traffic and it's been flat ever since and that's not what it looked like yesterday. And she goes and she's like, there's only one customer I can think of that would make that happen. She talks to the customer, before I even get in, she's got it solved. They've, they had a deploy that went wrong and they accidentally took, we were the dreaded third party cookie and they accidentally took us off their site. So. It's like the fact that you know, like a you know, non-technical like client success person could come in and look at the you know monitoring and telemetry, diagnose that, and fix it before I even got to work. Like I roll into stand up like you know with a with a soy chai latte, and I'm like, what's up? And she's like, well, I fixed this, and I'm like, giant hole in the graphs. Wow, why did I not have an alert for that? And then set a reactive alert because you know like every alert. I feel like every alert I would ever set would be because something went wrong. It's like you know. 
It's like, got to go to an airport. Well, you probably, if you're at least if you're in the U.S., you probably have to take your shoes off. Why? Well, someone tried something once, so now we're going to take our shoes off forever. And you're like, it's like, well, once a t customer took us off the website unexpectedly, and I had stuff like looking for giant traffic spikes, and I didn't have any alerts looking for a giant traffic drop. And like, okay, now that's something I have to look for. Um, but anyway, so when you're thinking about all those patterns, like making sure, for example, back to the idea of your, the way your architecture is, making sure that you have centralized logging. Like, centralized logging is table stakes. I, I mean, I assume everyone probably has it, but if you don't, like, you need to have a deep soul-searching conversation with yourself and then with whoever's not letting you have it and tell them that, like, centralized logging will make your life better. Like, seriously, just, if you don't have it now, just, like, go and set it up and come back. Like, I'll wait. It's like, it's, it's that important. <laughs> because you need to have that kind of visibility, right? Like, into what your systems are doing in production. And if you're thinking, no, 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 you don't understand. It's like, you're an ops person, but you don't understand. I'm a developer, I write my features, they're fantastic. Everything else is someone else's problem. It's like, it's got the somebody else's problem field from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy over it. It's like, no, because, you know what? Like, your life is going to be made way more difficult when there's some sort of bug and you have to stop working on the feature that you really wanted to ship in this particular iteration and instead, like, you know, work on some kind of bug that nobody had any visibility into because, like, no one from your team actually knew what was going on with Prod. It's like, that's why you need to have better glue between the organ, you know, between different parts of your organization. Um, and I think the other, the other thing that's going on that's kind of a common pattern now is that we have in our systems, like, we, we, you know, there was, a, there was a joke earlier about microservices, like, a, I didn't read the tweet, but I, I assume by the laughter a lot of you read it, and it's that, like the idea of microservices being, you know, like a murder mystery, and I'm like, well, it depends on how your monitoring is set up. But, I mean, you can usually tell which microservice is like, you know, its health check is full of deceit and lies. You're like, the health check says everything is 200 okay. And yet, and all those instances are staying in the load balancer, but nothing is working. And then you go and you check it, and you're like, oh, the reason it says it's 200 OK is because the health check always says that no matter what. That's fantastic. We're definitely going to have to fix that. Um, but I can't even fault the person who had that particular thing happen, because whether you're writing in a monolith that was originally or breaking it out into microservices, like, once you have enough code, not one person in your organization is going to really understand all of it which can sometimes lead to sadness and lots of, lots of feels. Like there's feels there if somebody, you know, is on the original engineering team and they really understood things and then you come in and you change things and they're like, now I have this feeling of uncertainty. And back to the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. I have this feeling of uncertainty because I don't really understand my entire software as much as I did before. And it's like, realistically, this, this is from um, uh, Jason Harris did this. If you haven't seen it, you should, you should go check it out. I, I was going to say it'll be in the show notes because I've clearly been podcasting too much. But um, I am going to post the slides with some notes afterwards, and I'll make sure to put a link to this. But this is the, you know, why you should never interrupt a programmer. And it's like because there's a lot of state that we hold in our heads, and there's a lot of state that you can't even fit into one person's head anymore. And that's, you definitely, like when you're, again, when you're trying to, architectural decisions, when you're trying to decide where the bounds of your microservice should be, well, I mean, one good clue is like, if you have something that's too big for any one person to really keep the model in their head, it's probably too big. Like, I don't think that microservices is about like, or, you know, service-oriented architecture, or whatever you want to call it, is about, um, about decomposition of, you know, giant balls of mud. I don't think it's really about number of lines of code so much as like the scope of exactly how much breadth this covers. And you know, if, if everything in your head looks like this all the time, you're probably working on too large of a problem set at a time. Um, but back to containers. Um, this, this picture, by the way, is from Portland. Uh, I don't know if any of you probably, maybe you didn't get any of the coverage of that, but I have no idea if you would or not. But there was a great deal of drama in Portland, Oregon, because they were replacing the carpet in the airport. And I'm just like, you people are way more attached to your airport carpet than I am, because I have no idea if we even have carpet at our airport. But anyway, so uh, this one, uh, the one closest to me was the, was the old carpet. The one further away is the new carpet. I think that they're similar enough that it's not terrible, but apparently this was a very emotional moment for a lot of people. Um, but, uh, but again, like some people are going to feel attached to different things. And it's, that's kind of back to the empathy thing. I was like, you know what? This matters a lot to some people. 
And th that's kind of one of the things where containers can make a really good boundary object for the things that matter to you a lot, say as a developer, is like, you really want to use this specific Java stuff and this specific like Node and Grunt and Bower and Gulp. And there's something in there about broccoli. And at this point, I'm like, are these real or is this made up? Like, I don't even know. But it's like front end, so many funny words. Um, why can't they just have like small collections of consonants like Unix? I mean, I don't know. Um, like unpronounceable, uh, you know, things that some of our friends name their cats. Um, but the idea of the container being this boundary where basically you have whatever the developer chose to do is inside the container. And then as long as it acts in a reasonably 12 factor ish way, and like, okay, I mean, 12 factor is not, you know, some sort of re received wisdom from like, you know, the top of Table Mountain, like handed down on stone tablets. I mean, it's, it's basically, um, Heroku propaganda, but you know, it's good Heroku propaganda. And I feel like, I mean, even if you, if you don't go for all 12, like eh, seven, eight, nine, go for some of the factors. And definitely the ones about like logging consistently, right? So as long as the containers are going to log in a way that you can consume via, you know, whatever uh, SaaS or self-hosted or whatever um, logging, monitoring, visibility tools of your choice, like, do you really care what you know, question, possibly questionable thing that the developer chose to do? Well, maybe. Like, you have to, again, this is kind of a good fences make good neighbors thing. Like, I think the biggest, the biggest, like, I would say, back to FUD, like, the biggest straw man argument that I've heard against the use of something like Docker is, yeah, but you won't know what's in these containers that the developers are shipping, and what if you have a security patch? And I'm like, yes, but... Presumably, any organization that's actually putting these images they're creating out into production has them going through their CI pipeline. I mean, I hope. Like, I mean, maybe they aren't, but they really should. And so, like, as long as you are generating your images through some sort of um, reproducible process where you don't have to be like, there was an app get, install a whole bunch of stuff in no versions, wonder what that's going to get me this time, and add contents of current working directory. I mean, I, I don't know what's in this current working directory. Like, of course, a Docker file in and of itself is not going to give you a reproducible artifact, but a build process that you've built in your, uh, in your CI pipeline will. So, like, I feel like that is, as long as you have containers that you can, you know, images that you can reproduce, like, you know, reliably and update without changing, you know, other functionality out or whatever, uh, they can make for a pretty good, our group is going to care about this stuff, and your group is going to care about that stuff. So, like, when you do need a separation of concerns in your organization, like, containers can actually be really helpful for that. Um, because, but we do, we want to make sure that we don't fall prey to, like, the classic wall of confusion. And you've probably seen these images before, like, this idea of, like, dev just throwing code over the wall, or, like, the, the classic antagonism because of the tension between being incented as to SLAs and MTTRs and uptime or being incented as to, you know, velocity of, like, what they're shipping. Like, th this does, this sort of wall does lead to a lot of problems, but I feel like it's, it's even worse than that. Like, in most organizations, I, think, I feel like the wall of confusion is a lot more, like, I don't even know what's over there. It's, it's probably, you know, it's the dreaded north. There's probably white walkers up there. Like, I don't even know. And trying to make sure that you can get past that in an organization. Like, making sure that no matter whether, like, say, maybe some people on the ops team made a base image, and then a bunch of devs are checking in Docker files that are doing a from that, but then they look at the Docker file for the base image, and, oh, wait, no, they can't, because ops put it in a repo they can't see. And it's like, oh, okay, so that's a problem. So put that someplace where people can look at it, and they can say, you know, we're, we're using Ubuntu, but do we have to be? Could we be using Alpine? Or maybe conversely, I've been having to add all of these packages because nothing is working. Oh, you're using Alpine. Okay, that's why. And so, like, I feel like getting past, like, this, we have all of this, you know, miscommunication or lack of communication between groups is super important. And if you're thinking, like, right now, oh, but, you know, this is not a problem for us because we work at a five-person startup and, like, every single person has the prod AWS keys anyway and, like, nobody fights about this stuff. I'm like, that's cool. I mean, that's great. And that means that you're going to have a lot of people around you who are not in that fortunate situation and who might be working in organizations where the enterprise IT architecture team has a lot of opinions about containers 
where they think that they interfere with the way that they uh, currently operate everything that begins with a V or whatever. Because a lot of things begin with V for reasons that are unclear to me. Um, but you want to instead, you want to have like, instead of a giant impenetrable wall, you want to have like room for the human connections like between, around, like, Sure, like whatever you need to make your organization work, you're going to do, but having that transparency, having that communication where you're ready to behave in a way like what Bethany was talking about with Etsy of like, you're gonna be able to have truth and blamelessness when you say, you know, yes, I'm, I'm not super thrilled that this health check like in no way actually was, you know, working, but you didn't write it that way because, I mean, you didn't write just return 200, okay. Like, that's not what they wrote, okay? Like, what actually, what they actually wrote was test the image resizing on this, you know, on this image that we have right here locally. And, like, that worked. The problem was that what the image resizer actually needed to do was get things from S3 and resize them. And so because the test wasn't testing that full path to S3 and back, like, it wasn't answering, it wasn't testing the right thing. Like, back to the... You want your automated tests, well, including your health checks, to actually be checking the right thing. But like this, this wasn't a situation where it would have been useful, even if I got awakened in the middle of the night, it wouldn't have been useful for me to, you know, be angry about it or argue about it. Like just accept that they thought that they were doing like the minimum viable test and we found out that they weren't. Um, and like when, instead of like thinking about stuff, like, you know, that other team, they're just behind this giant big wall. If you look at the individual people and get to know some of the individual people in the team. Like, it's a lot more difficult to be angry at somebody for breaking my sequel after you, you, like, you sing karaoke with them. It's like, you know, it's, it, you're just less likely to be. I get from oddly specific answer, or, or sorry, oddly specific example, because it actually happened to me. Um, and that kind of, again, when you're thinking about the, everyone's needs and desires, like, that kind of does lead us in this direction of bike shedding and like infinite choices. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of trouble choosing which ice cream I want, let alone when there's this many cones to choose from. And like, I feel like this is, this is kind of our metaphor for like the JavaScript fam framework of the week. Like it's Friday, right? Like we have a new framework by now, right? Um, and so the, basically I, I look at the idea that you wanna give people agency. Like you wanna give people the ability to make their own choices in, inside the bounds or constraints of however you can make it work for your organization, again, containerization is a really useful technology for that, but you still need to actually talk to each other to decide what those bounds are gonna be in your organization. And like, like that's not something that you're gonna be able to just, you know, like magically apply some technology to and have it work. I mean, the technology isn't even magic on its own. Like, ask me over drinks later about like race conditions and device mapper because that device mapper is basically sadness as a service. Like you should definitely not use that. You should use AUFS or overlay or I don't know. I, I hear terrible things about ButterFS, but you know, whichever, just don't use device mapper. Um, but letting somebody bike shed that and you know, indefinitely isn't going to help either. And this, this is actually really interesting too. And I don't, I don't have a link to, um, I'll put a link in the notes, but <laughs> I know, right? I'll put a link in the notes, but basically uh, Eric Brewer came up with CAP theorem, and then 12 years later he wrote an interesting article for InfoQ where he talked about kind of like some of the subtleties in the idea of, um, you know, are you going to decide, do you want to be, you know, like, you know, like do you care about more about consistency, about availability, and like the thing about partition tolerance when you're, like, honestly CAP theorem applies to human interaction too, right? Because I mean, how many of you, like, are going to wait for 10 hours for California to wake up before you can decide something? And they basically have a lock. Like, if, you're, if your organization has centralized decision-making and it's centralized in a time zone that is 10 hours behind you, like, you're going to spend a lot of time, like, wondering how long are we going to let this partition go before we just uh, declare that we are going to be in split brain for a while. And if you are willing to have those conversations inside your organization and like decentralize that decision making. Um, we were talking a little bit about console earlier and like, yeah, the reason it's so fast and effective is that gossip protocol. Like, okay, well we need, the, we need an equivalent thing to console's gossip protocol for interaction between teams. Like they don't have to, and if your organization does force people to go up through a central authority and then back down, or the dreaded file a ticket, like no, like file a ticket is bullshit. You should definitely not file a ticket. Um, and like, instead of filing a ticket, you should just actually talk to each other. Because, and not only talk, but listen. 
because I, I don't know about you, but like I've definitely been in the meetings where it's clear that someone is just waiting for their turn to talk. And like right now is my turn to talk because I'm standing here and I have a mic, but I want to listen to, I have been listening to you folks and I want to listen to you a lot more right after this with uh, drinks, which by the way, I know I'm going a tiny bit long and I know I'm the last thing standing between you and beer. So I will, uh, I will attempt to hurry it up a little bit. Um, but this idea of like active listening. So when you're, when you're in that meeting and somebody says a thing and you know, they, they say that, you know, they want something and you're like, that sort of, sort of sounds ludicrous. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they really want to develop an Erlang message bus. And you're like, okay, and what problem are we going to solve with this? Like, because I'm hearing you say that you want to develop an Erlang message bus. We repeat back to them, like, what problem are we going to solve? And, like, honestly, if the answer is the problem of me wanting to develop an Erlang message bus, like, that's okay. Because they're being honest, like, that's what they want to work on. And, hey, maybe that's what they should do. But at least being able to, uh, find out why they want something is a lot better than just saying no. And like the, the idea of um, just writing stuff down is like that's not necessarily going to solve everything, but you probably should. I, I don't, we talked about documentation earlier. I don't really believe in documentation. I mean, the problem with documentation is it's always going to be outdated the minute you write it. What I really believe in is the detailed commit message at the time that says why you did it. Because later, like someone else or, you know, future you isn't going to look back and be like, past you of six months ago, why did you do this? Why? And there was probably a reason. So, like, writing down why you did something I think is super, super valuable compared to, like, this does X. And you're like, I can see that. I can read the code. I just don't know why. <laughs> and, but, so then you're thinking, okay, so you're telling us to just write everything down. But, like, there isn't actually, like, a giant checklist or, like, you know, a I can tell you that if you take these 42 steps, you will have dev'd all the ops and dockered all the dockers and everything will be magically great for you. Like that's not actually true either, but you probably are gonna probably wanna write a little bit more than you do now, just because I know how it is. It's like you write the code, you're like, I don't, code comments are lies anyways, right? I mean, I should probably have added that slide with the, the box of um, watermelons with like the, the signage that said pumpkins or the other way around, I can't remember which way it went. Um, but, all right, so if we've established DevOps is definitely culture and not something that you're going to buy, um, then like talking about what the choices you're going to make are, like in order to have the culture that you want to have, pretty important. I would say like short list would be have a good way to figure out whether or not you're progressing in the direction you want to, right? So like. I was super busy and, you know, changing jobs last summer. And then um, we went and picked a bunch of stuff from our garden. And those are patty pan squash. I don't know if you have them here, but they're supposed to be like super small, like smaller than your fist. And they were enormous and inedible. And so like when I saw that they were giant, I was like, this is great. And then I was like, no, this isn't great. This is terrible. But like, okay, what were we measuring? It's like, well, nothing in this case, obviously. So, and like another example is like, Heavyweight process is often, like we talked about earlier, that it's the scar tissue of past failures. Like I was in this hotel in Amsterdam, and if you can't read that, it says in several languages, we kindly request you to take your shower in the bathtub. And there was one of these stickers in every hotel bathroom at that hotel. A number of people tweeted it and thought it was hilarious. And I was like, what happened enough that they really needed to put this sticker in every bathroom? <laughs> But I feel like there's probably something on your deployment checklist that is because something like that happened enough where you're like, all right, we just have to write down that you have to watch out. Like, don't, don't touch the stove. It's hot. We don't know why. Um, and the, the last thing I guess I want to I tell you is, like, it is okay if you feel like you cannot stay on top of this stuff. It's like our industry is changing constantly. Like, I'm here to tell you it really is fine. Like, even if you think... I, I think I understand Docker, but now I have like eight new things I need to learn in order to orchestrate my containers, and I don't even know which one I want. Do I even, do I have to orchestrate them? Like, I don't know. Can't they just kind of do some improv jazz? Like, I don't know. Like, when you're, when you're worried about trying to stay on top of this stuff, like, just, just try to be as, as mellow as a tack kitten there. He's, he's a four-month-old kitten. We have a, we have a house sitter at home with him while we're on this trip. But um, it, it is sort of hard to stay on top of this stuff. So I don't know. I guess my, my recommendation would be, like, have uh, Adrian get you a lot of laptop stickers so you can just learn all the stuff through osmosis. Like, it works for the kitten. Um, and so, like, the, basically, like, my final thought is that this DevOps thing or, you know, all of the stuff that we're trying to accomplish, it is um, 
it is the journey. It's not like you're going to get there. It's, it's going on the, the journey together. Like, this is not actually my first visit to South Africa. I came in 2009. I drove the garden route with my brother. It was delightful. And uh, we started in Cape Town, which was wonderful. We ended in Port Elizabeth, which was decidedly less exciting than Cape Town. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but it was a wonderful trip. It was a beautiful, beautiful drive. And like going along that journey was the important part. Like the destination where we ended up was like not really the point. So um, with that, thank you. And uh, I think instead of making you sit here and listen to other people ask questions, we should just all go drink beer and you can talk to me as much as you like there. All right, take care.